on a previous episode of Shadow Realm. It's time we had your thread ceremony. The thread ceremony is a sacred rite of passage. You don't care if I'm good or bad. You have no idea what I do. Why, Arya? Why this senseless act? You did this to embarrass us, didn't you? Not like you don't do enough to embarrass me. Welcome to my world, Ma. So what? You assume that by doing this you could get even? Maybe. About what? I don't want the thread ceremony. I see. So it's off? Excuse me? Well, I mean, now that you have all the damage money to pay and you hate me, you're going to cancel the party, right? No. I don't hate you, and you will have your thread ceremony. What? There's nothing you could do that would ever stop me from giving you what you need, and you need to understand the value of the Vedas more than I had realized. No. No friggin' way. Arya, Arya, what are you doing? It's a red light. Ma? Oh my god. Ma? It was too late. Oh my god. The left side of her body had been crushed by the bus's rear wheel as it hurtled down the streets of Chinatown. I had no answers. I just stood there, shell-shocked. Two policemen escorted me to my worry-stricken father, who had been summoned home in the middle of the afternoon shift. He sank to the floor, speechless, like he had seen a ghost. By the time we arrived in the hospital, Ma was already strapped to a life support machine. She's in a coma. If she doesn't come out of it in the next 48 hours, it's not clear that she ever will. Pa's face turned ashen. It wasn't fair. She was in a coma because of me. And yet I had escaped, unscathed. We didn't make it home that night, or to school or work the next day. For two whole days, I sat glued to a hard hospital chair in Ma's room, while Pa paced the halls outside. How did our world turn upside down in a matter of moments, and without any warning? Three weeks later, nothing had changed. I could see the hospital staff getting tired of nursing Ma, day after day. I'm sorry to tell you this, but she's showing no signs of improvement. You might want to consider taking her off life support. The words struck me like a burning arrow. Disconnecting my mother's life support systems would mean disconnecting her from life itself. How could a doctor of all people be so inhuman to suggest this with such callousness? No! My mother's a doctor too. Only she helps sick people unlike you! Look, I understand. This is hard for you. But we need the hospital beds for those we can truly help. And then something happened that I'd never seen before. Pa, who was always so calm, always had very little to say and was always so polite, completely lost it. Does my wife's life hold less value than that of others? Is it because we are poor? Colored? Foreign? Or... We do not speak English as well as you? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. She has a husband and a son. We are her family. Okay, maybe we should continue this discussion when you've calmed down a little. After a day of intense negotiation, Pa and the doctor reached a compromise. They'd move Ma to a nursing home outside the city where she wouldn't bother anyone as long as he continued to pay medical bills. Give it time, they said at the nursing home. But I didn't do well with Ma being comatose. I missed her laughter. The scent of her Ayurvedic oils still wafted down our corridors, filling our home with the aroma of loneliness. There was a part of me that wanted to save her, and another part of me that hated her for what she had become, for leaving us. So I resolved never to go back to the nursing home. 
At school, the boys were completely unsympathetic to my situation, and I was too in my head thinking about Ma to care about keeping my place in their group. So things went back to normal. I became a goop eater again, and then a terrorist, and soon enough, I was getting into fights and finding myself in the head of school's office again. At home, Pa really stepped up. He changed his shift so that he would be at home for me every day. He started cooking fragrant curries and slow-cooked dal like Ma used to make. He even supervised my math homework teaching me tricks that he had learned as a boy in his village school. I definitely developed newfound respect for him. Until one day. Arya, we need to talk. I have been thinking, this is not going to come easy, but perhaps it is time we let her go. You can't possibly be saying what I think you're saying. It is time to pull the plug, Arya. No! You can't! We can't! I know it's not what you want to hear. Believe me. It is not what I'd ever want to say. Ma is not just a mother. She's a rock. She always helps me make sense of things I don't understand. Who am I going to talk to about the Ramayana next time I have a question? I haven't heard her voice in so long that now I'm starting to forget what it sounds like. Maybe it's best if you stored those memories of Ma away like a buried treasure. No. Without her, nothing is worth anything. Come on, Arya. Eat some dinner. I don't want your lousy cooking! I stormed out of the kitchen to Ma's study room. All around me were the shelves that housed her vast collection of books. Seized by some strange depravity, I pulled out the books at random and began leafing through them. Who knew what I was searching for? I didn't. I couldn't even tell. But some voice in my head urged me to search. Keep searching, it said. In your quest, you might find an answer. It sounded like Ma's eternal mantra. Maybe it was even some some crazy telepathic message from her. But what the heck should I even search for? Satyajit Ray's poetry? The works of Swami Vivekananda? Ancient hymns of the Rig Veda? Almost like a divine intervention, a ray of sunshine crept in through the skylight and cast its glow on one particular book, encircling it with a halo of liquid gold. It was a frayed leather-bound book with gilded writing on the cover. The Ramayan. It was Ma's copy, the one that she read from every night. It was musty, with delicate pages that had yellowed over time. Written in Sanskrit by Valmiki, one of the great sages of ancient India, the Ramayan told the story of Prince Ram of Ayodhya in 24,000 verses. The verses brought back a familiar rush of warmth. I thumbed through the pages. I could strangely feel Ma's presence in the room. I heard her laugh. I envisioned her smiling face. And I took a whiff of her perfume from the musty pages of the book. I ran my finger down the verses. Even though I didn't fully understand, I knew I was looking at the source of everything. The stories of my people and the tribe from which we had originated. I was also searching for the end point. But where should I begin? I heard her voice. The Ramayan takes you on a unique journey, Marg Darshan, a healing journey that shows you the road further. The source leads you along the road to the end point, but once you arrive there, you will find yourself back at the source, ready to start your journey again. And so, continue. I would remember these words time and time again over the several journeys that forked into the main journey of my life. But of course, I didn't know it at the time. The only thing really going through my head was that I had somehow hit the spot. I flipped through the end of the first chapter. As long as man lives upon earth, the story of Ram shall be told. The words almost jumped off the page. 
If the Ramayan did provide a healing journey, then perhaps there was hope after all. Maybe I could heal her with its stories. Why the heck had I stayed away from her all this time? I raced back to the nursing home that afternoon so I could explain to Ma what I had found. Hey, you're back. We've missed you. What's that in your hands? It's Ma's copy of the Ramayan. It tells the story of Prince Ram of Ayodhya. She used to read from it every night when I was a little kid. Looks very old. It's an out-of-print edition. I thought I would read it to her. I think that's a great idea. Come on. Ma, it was wrong of me not to visit for so long. But look, I came across your copy of the Ramayan. I can read it to you now, just as you did to me. But I need you to help me understand it better. Like the stories of our people, where we originate from. As long as man lives upon earth, the story of Ram shall be told. I searched for a flicker of response, but all that moved was the heart rate monitor, proving that despite her illness, she was still alive. Oh, come on! You said it yourself. Keep searching. You said that I might find an answer in my quest. So give me a sign, please. But... nothing. Ugh, it's just a waste of time. What's wrong? What did I think was gonna happen? I'd read to her from this book and like magic she would get up and walk out of here and... And what, everything would go back to normal? What did you do that for? Yesterday I wondered how we would survive without her. But the truth is, we're already surviving! She can still hear you, you know? Ah, to f*** with it! Thank you for listening to Shadow Realm. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with someone who'd love to journey through the Aria Chronicles. Visit theariachronicles.com for more information. Be sure to rate and review us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Coming up on Shadow Realm. All of a sudden, my bed began to quiver, which turned into a shake and then a shudder. Stay tuned for more. <laughs>